Well, good day and welcome to week number six here on our Chronological Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. We are well and truly into the book of Exodus, this week reading chapters 19 through to 38. Today's tutorial comes to you from the road. It was recorded on a ministry trip with my good friend, Rob Rufus. So sit back, relax and enjoy. So last week, as we saw, as the people came through the Red Sea, a nation was born. Uh, the family of Abram, which has become the family of Israel, has now well and truly become a nation. And the uh, Exodus taught us that there was uh, over 600,000 men who were part of Israel, and that's how they grew in the time in Egypt. So a lot of theologians reckon there could have been up to 2 million people that were part of this nation. So they've now come through the Red Sea, they've been baptized into Moses, and this what we're reading this week is all about a new government and a new covenant, all right? So they're a nation now. So these people need a new form of governance to govern them. They need some civil laws to bring them together as a, as a nation to identify how they relate to one another. So that's kind of like horizontal laws. But the other thing we're reading this week mixed in with that is that they also enter in, into a new covenant with God, which is about not how they relate to one another primarily, but how they relate to God. And this is really, really a hugely significant part of the Bible story as they're at Mount Sinai. Okay, so the people are at Mount Sinai, this is now a couple of weeks since they come out of the Red Sea. And one of the things we've noticed in the last couple of chapters is how really poorly behaved these people are. That is not to go unnoticed, all right? Since they've come through the Red Sea in the last few chapters, they've been whinging, they've been whining, they've complained about food and about water and about wanting to go back to Egypt, right? Rah, 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 all that type of stuff. But I want you to take notice of how kind and gracious God has been to them. He's not once cursed them or rebuked them or punished them. He's only been good to them despite the fact they're behaving like a bunch of rat bags so far. <laughs> but that's all about to change. That's all about to change. And we're going to notice that this week. Uh, God then speaks to them about coming to Mount Sinai. And he says, listen, guys, finally, I want to speak to you myself. Because up to this point with Israel, with the nation out of Egypt, God has only spoken to Moses uh, and Aaron. Okay, And Moses has been God's spokesperson to God's people. But when they come to Sinai now, God's saying, I want to speak to you myself. Okay, I'm, You're going to hear my voice for yourself because I want all of you to be uh, effectively a nation of priests, people that can hear God for yourself. So I want you to come to me at the mountain and get ready to meet me. And I just only noticed this this week as I was reading. It's really funny. But um, God actually says to them, I want you to wash yourself to be ready to meet with me. And when Moses comes down the mountain and says to God's people, God says he wants us to wash ourselves, all right? He also says this. He says, God wants you to wash yourself and also not have sex today. Don't have sex for a day. And it just struck me how easy it is um, to have a religious mindset that always wants to add to what God has said. It's a bit like what Eve did, all right, in the garden, when she says, God said we can't eat the fruit, uh, and not only that, but we must not even touch it, okay? She's always, religion always adds to what God has said uh, and, um, and to sort of virtue signal about how good we can be. And that's just an interesting little subtlety that I picked up this week as uh, Moses starts to introduce the law uh, to God's people. But anyway, the point is, God speaks to them at Mount Sinai for the first time they hear his voice. And rather than falling in love with that voice, the people absolutely freak out which is amazing because they've just seen a whole bunch of plagues in Egypt, okay? They've just seen whole Pharaoh's army die. They've seen river turn into blood. They've seen gnats and boils and frogs and all sorts of things happening, yet somehow thunder and lightning scares them, which doesn't really add up physically, but there's something about them not wanting to engage with God on a one-on-one -on -one level. And they say, Moses, we don't want this. You speak to God for us. And so out of this situation, what happens is that God establishes for them a place to worship. God establishes for them prescriptions by which they must worship. And uh, this involves blood sacrifices, which we'll read all about in Leviticus. And then he also establishes a priesthood, a people to represent, rather than them all being priests, a priesthood from Aaron and Moses' family, the tribe of Levi, to represent God to the people. So they're given two things in this week's readings, a civil law to govern them, to govern how they relate to one another about animals and property rights and all that type of thing, but also a new covenant where God basically says, if you don't do what I say, I will become your enemy uh, and I will curse you. 
And the people in chapter 24 agree to that. They say, yes, yes, yes. Three times they agree. And in chapter 24, there's a blood covenant made. So just an interesting observation. When we talk about the blood of covenants, like Abraham, there was bloodshed. When God entered into a covenant with Abraham, it happens here again. The, the blood of the Moses covenant was not the Passover blood. Okay, The blood of the Moses covenant is what happens here in chapter 24 when Moses goes up the mountain and gets the commandments written on stone. And as you'll see in chapter 30, 33, I think it is, when he comes back down the mountain uh, and all hell is breaking. Well, not all hell is breaking loose. They're just having a big party. But God's wrath breaks out against people for the very first time. So I really want you to see that shift this week. God has been blessing his people, even though they've been disobedient to him and really poorly behaved. And yet when the law comes, this law covenant comes, as soon as they misbehave, Moses comes down the mountain and God threatens to kill them and to wipe them off from the face of the earth. What we are witnessing here is the emergence of a whole new covenantal agreement. You and I call it the old covenant now because we're three and a half thousand years from history, okay? But to them, it's a brand new yeah. covenant. So yeah. otherwise, we could call it the law covenant or the mosaic covenant. Yeah. So I just want to ask you, Rob, you've preached often on the difference with the, what we have in Jesus, the new covenant and the old covenant. This is language that Hebrews brings up, Paul the Apostle often brings up. Um, what is it that you would like people to see when they read the story of Moses and how that fits into the big picture and the coming of this covenant, the, the law covenant? Yeah. So it's a very significant time that Israel is coming, came into when they came back under the law or came into the law for the first time. Mm. And so it can be described in two words. You, you have an intrinsic covenant and an extrinsic covenant. An extrinsic covenant is something that happens outside of you. It has nothing to do with you. Uh, you simply put faith in God. So that happened with Abraham. Mm. Abraham was put to sleep and God made a covenant based on grace and faith. Not based on Abraham's performance, but in believing in God's goodness. And God credited Abraham as righteousness. And so that's the way he treated Israel. When they were in slavery, he brought them out of slavery based on, a, uh, on an extrinsic covenant. It had nothing to do with them deserving it. It happened outside of them and God brought them out. And he never judged them. And so there was the sense of them complaining. But eventually God says, okay, I'm going to bring to you an intrinsic coven covenant, which is the covenant of the law. An intrinsic covenant means it's all to do with us. Uh, we have to move first. If we do the right thing, then God will do a good thing. If we do a bad thing, then God will bring the condemnation and curse of the law. So, so what they were coming in, they were moving out of an extrinsic covenant where all the good things happened outside of them. And they were now moving into an intrinsic covenant that everything they did, whether it was good or bad, God would treat them according to the law. So the law is like God's view and opinion of you. He sees you through the, the exactitudes of the law. And the true spirituality of the law will judge you all the time. will find curse, condemnation. Uh, but through grace, he sees you through the gift of righteousness and he sees you perfect already. So, so the law is like a mirror. You look in the mirror and you can see what's wrong with you. You can see your hair is wrong. You've got bit meat in your teeth. But you can't use the law to clean you up. It has no power to clean you up. But when you come to, then, but grace gives you that power to, to clean you up. So, so the, there, there's an amazing thing that we have in the grace covenant. It's extrinsic. It happened outside of you. The covenant was cut between Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit administrates it and you were included in Christ. So in the new covenant, everything is done outside of you in the perfect covenant cut within the infallible and invincible perfection of the Trinity. And you were included in that. And God's view and opinion of you through grace is you're the righteousness of God forever and ever and treats you with the power of the blessing. So, so it's so important to have a, because what we're trying to do in this series is to give us a big picture view of the Bible. Yeah. So as we read this covenant this week, as we see what happens at Sinai, we understand that it, it's the same God that we worship, yeah. but it's a totally different relationship Yes. that we have today, three, three and a half yes. thousand years later because yes. of Jesus and what he did. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so on the day the law came, the Bible says 3,000 people were put to death. We're going to read that this week. Okay. Yeah, when Moses comes down the mountain. Yeah, yeah. 3,000 were put to death uh, on the day that the law covenant came. Because it's a, it's a ministry, the Bible calls it a ministry of death with a fading glory. But on the day the new covenant came, come on, 3,000 people were saved. And they'd done some really bad things before that. Uh, you know, they were worshipping a golden 
calf, and when the law came, yeah, and they're running around naked actually, and three thousand put to death. They just crucified Jesus in the new covenant, and yet on that day, when the new covenant came, three thousand people were saved because it's a covenant of life. And so, look, as we read this story, you know, it's a, we're reading a progressive story through the scripture. When this law covenant comes. Up to this point, it seems like a good thing. It is a good thing. And it's better to have a covenant with God than to not. But you and I now, three and a half thousand years later, on this side of the cross, look back and with Paul's revelation where he says it was actually a ministry of death, we are so grateful that we've been offered a relationship with God that is vastly superior. Like the, the author of Hebrews says, it is a vastly superior arrangement that we have today. So enjoy this reading. Uh, through Exodus um, chapters 19 through to 38. If you want to sneak in the last couple of chapters, of course, of Exodus, you can always do that and just cap it off nicely. Uh, it's largely got to do with the coming of a new governing system, a new government, a new government, a new covenant, and with that, a new place of worship, prescriptions for worship, and a priesthood by which people worship. So this last half of the uh, book of Exodus is really, really significant and will set something of a tone uh, for essentially the next 14 hundred years of God's people up into the age of Jesus in the first century uh, until this form of relationship with God uh, comes to an end. All right, but enjoy Exodus this week. Remember, you can read it through in one sitting. Uh, those chapters I did it the other day or did it actually on the plane just now, just read through it in one sitting. Um, otherwise, uh, spend a couple of days doing it, but don't uh, don't lose track, all right? Keep up with us and uh, we're going to get through this uh, scripture in a year uh, uh, through the lenses of a chronological idea. So, Rob, thank you for being with us. Our, with our, you. our first guest in our chronological Bible reading plan. Uh, it's great to have you guys joining with us. Thanks, Steve. We'll see you next weekend as we head into Leviticus. Okay, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. All right, bless you guys. That's it for today's lesson. I really hope you enjoy your readings this week. Remember, allow yourself time to read as much as you can in one sitting. Don't get lost in the detail. Just keep going and watch the Bible's big story unfold before you. Remember also to hit me up on our social media channels or website, and I'll see you next time.